Hello and welcome to Oregon OSHA's Facebook Live session on the recently adopted temporary rule addressing COVID-19 risks in Oregon workplaces. My name is Michael Wood and I'm the administrator of the Occupational Safety and Health Division of the Oregon Department of Consumer and Business Services, which we normally refer to as simply Oregon OSHA. With me for this live session to uh, help with the questions and answers is Matt Kaiser, who is a senior industrial hygienist in our technical session and who was the primary contact for technical issues in the development of the rule. So just to give everybody some context, this discussion is about the rule that was adopted two weeks ago today and that took effect, at least in its initial provisions, on Monday. And so the rule is in effect as of November 16th, and it provides guidance across all workplaces in the state of Oregon, every place that is subject to the jurisdiction of Oregon OSHA. To give you just a sense about the basic requirements in the rule before we dive right into whatever questions folks may have, I, the first requirements are very familiar things. They're the sorts of things that we've all been hearing about and that in fact Oregon OSHA has been enforcing based on direction from the governor in executive orders and mandatory guidance from the Oregon Health Authority. So for example, the rule does require that employers design their work and workflow so that it's not necessary for employees to be within six feet of each other. And it does allow employers to demonstrate that there are situations where they couldn't engage in such a redesign. But as a basic expectation, that same six foot requirement that we've been hearing about for eight months remains as a basic expectation in all workplaces in the state. In addition, there is a basic expectation that people indoors and in most outdoor settings right now wear facial coverings in accordance with the most recent applicable workplace guidance from the Oregon Health Authority. We also require that people in vehicles with other individuals who are not part of their own household during work activities wear a facial covering. So regardless of distancing, all passengers in a motor vehicle in the workplace need to have a facial covering on. The rule has some sanitation requirements. It also addresses some questions about ventilation that really focus on getting the best use out of your existing ventilation system. Employers are not required to upgrade or modify or replace their ventilation system as part of the requirements on this rule. Um, and then finally, the real guts of the rule are in some of the delayed requirements, which take effect later on. Um, there is a risk assessment that employers need to do in conjunction with their employees. There is a, an infection control plan based on that risk assessment that employers need to complete and conduct and for anybody who's got more than 10 employees, they need to document those things in writing. Um, and then there's training, again, based on that plan. We've put out a lot of resources already with different examples and templates, and we'll continue to do that in the weeks to come to assist employers in complying with those requirements. There also is a completely separate set of requirements that builds upon those things for those places that are under exceptional risk. Basically, healthcare, um, emergency response, law enforcement, first responders, those sorts of operations. And that's the, the basic rundown of the rule. Now, of course, there are other requirements that apply in Oregon, especially this week. Um, the freeze is on based on the governor's executive order and took effect Wednesday. That's not part of this rule, but Oregon OSHA is enforcing those expectations as well and we continue to enforce situation-specific Oregon Health Authority guidance that in some cases may go beyond the basic requirements of the Oregon OSHA rule. And so with that background, unless Matt has anything to add, I think we're ready to go ahead and uh, tackle some questions. It's a pleasure, let's, let's get started. So the first question up is the basic question of why was it necessary for Oregon OSHA to pursue this rule? 
Of course, the short answer is it's a response to the COVID-19 pandemic um, that has been plaguing, in an almost literal sense, our society over the past eight months. But the reason that we actually decided we needed to have a rule rather than just relying on enforcing our general requirements and applying the Oregon Health Authority guidance is that we did want to lay those things out as a minimum standard so that businesses and their workers knew what to expect as they looked at operations. We also wanted to focus on some of the things that weren't part of that. Um, discussions like ventilation, the risk assessment, the development of the infection control plan and the training. Um, those are some of the requirements that don't necessarily go beyond what good employers are doing today, but they do go beyond what was strictly required in the context of Oregon Health Authority guidance. So the next question is what kind of input we got in developing the rule. Um, although this was a temporary rule, and so it didn't go through the normal public comment period that would be involved in developing a permanent rule, we did spend about four months developing and finalizing the rule. We produced a total of four drafts, which we made available to stakeholders and members of the public. Even before we produced the first draft, we had more than a dozen sessions with stakeholders and members of the public about what sorts of things might need to be in the rule and what issues we needed to address. And so we really spent the time through July and August, September and October, working on the rule, refining the original proposals before we settled on the rule that we adopted two weeks ago. Um, for a temporary process, for a temporary rulemaking, it was actually a very extensive public record. And all told, we probably received more than 1,800 comments from people throughout the state at various stages of the rulemaking process. And so the next question is, what are some examples of what the rule does that are different from what we've seen about guidance from the Oregon Health Authority? Um, I mentioned some of the broad general issues earlier. I guess I will turn this one over to Matt to see if there's any additional specifics that he wants to talk about in the context of the rule going beyond mandatory OHA guidance. Thank you. So of course the OHA guidance um, that we've seen so far does include a lot of general things such as sanitation, distancing, and face covering use. But things that this Oregon OSHA temporary rule does that differs from Oregon Health Authority are there are more requirements related to specific training uh, for certain uh, employee groups and there are requirements to perform an exposure risk assessment in addition to that. These are some of the things that aren't present in that general OHA guidance that we hope to be able to bring forward and is now applicable here with this uh, COVID-19 temporary rule. Of course, we also have our ventilation requirements that are found in the rule, and that is something that is rather new in regards to the guidance that has existed before uh, this rule was adopted. And that is one distinction that I would highlight in regards to what makes this Oregon OSHA rule different than uh, that previous OHA general guidance. Another specific provision of the rule that isn't found in the mandatory OHA guidance has to do with reporting exposures in the workplace. And so the rule does include a requirement that employers have a process for notifying their employees, um, both those who were exposed in, in terms of having had likely exposure to an individual with confirmed COVID-19 as well as those who were in the area who don't appear to have been exposed to that individual, but they were working on the same floor or in the same building, and so they may have had exposure. Uh, that's something that I think most employers had already worked out processes to put in place, but it does make it an explicit requirement. And in addition, it makes clear that because it's a requirement, the limited sharing of a certain amount of healthcare information in broad, non-specific terms is certainly not only legal, but required. And so that's probably an important piece to mention. So the next question up asks if the employer is responsible for reporting cases to the health department or do physicians and testing centers do that? And the answer to this question is no, the employer doesn't need to take on that responsibility unless they happen to somehow become aware of a case where there's no physician or testing center involved. 
otherwise they take those into organizations take care of the reporting to the local public health so the next question is how aggressive will oregon osha be with um, citing operators for non-compliance or will it be more of an educating approach um, the answer is that we're going to continue to handle COVID-19 much the way we've been handling it to date. Uh, we've talked about the fact that we've received more than 15,000 complaints related to COVID-19 so far this year. Just to give you some context, in a typical year, we receive about 2,000 complaints total from all sources. Um, we're actually receiving more non-COVID complaints this year than normal, almost twice as many as we would normally expect. So our overall volume is much, much greater. Um, but that actually works out all right in most cases because while under normal times, about half the complaints we receive actually result in an inspection, that's really not necessary in the case of a lot of COVID complaints. So we're able to address things through letters or primarily through what we call the phone and fax process. We call it that because it was named a couple decades ago. It's really a phone and email process where we make contact with the employer. We describe the allegations we've heard. We make sure that they're aware of the current requirements, which in this case would include our recently taking effect of the rule. Um, and then we ask them to let us know what they're doing and how they're addressing the hazards. And if they need to make changes, whether they're prepared to make those changes. We've been able to resolve more than two thirds of the complaints we've received to date handling that method. And we've done fewer than 200 total inspections. Now it is true, if we encounter an employer who isn't prepared to come into compliance, we may end up initiating an inspection. And in some cases, those penalties can be significant. For non-willful violations, the penalties have actually ranged between $100 and $2,000 total which aren't crippling by any means. Um, and they reflect the fact that we're all seeking to sort of find our way in this new reality. But we do have half a dozen cases where the employer has willfully refused to comply before the inspection. And frankly, in all of these cases, willfully continued to refuse to comply even after we initiated the inspection. And the penalties in those cases right now have ranged from $8,900 to the highest being $14,000. Um, it's possible that we'll see even higher penalties. The maximum penalty for a willful violation in this state is actually above $126,000. So even when it comes to citing willfuls, we've been relatively restrained. So the next question is, must training be assigned and mandated or is the rule does the rule only require that it be made available? Um, I think I'll let Matt go ahead and answer this one. Thank you, Michael. So there are two different training requirements found in the temporary rule for uh, COVID-19, the first of which can be found in 3I, and those are gonna be the basic requirements that are applicable to all workplaces, including those that are exceptional risk. There's also a second training component specific to infection uh, control and that is only going to be applicable to those exceptional risk workplaces. Now, the second part of that question asked about materials related to that required training. Oregon OSHA is in development, in the development phase of providing that training information for, uh, for employers. And so we hope to have that available on our infectious disease rulemaking page and on our agency website here shortly. But to be clear, while you're not required to put on the training that we provide, you are required to put on the training and employees need to take part in it. Um, just as is true with our training requirements in other contexts, this training is mandatory and the affected employees need to receive it, not simply be offered it. So the next question asks for non-healthcare employees such as a manufacturing facility or welding shop who use a powered air purifying respirator for their work, is it a form of source control or excuse me, is a form of source control separate from that PAPR, such as a mask on the employee's face, still required? And the answer is that if you're using a respirator, such as a PAPR that has an exhalation valve, you do need to use some sort of force, source control to make sure that the employee's exhaled air 
isn't exposing others to risk. That's the basic concept of source control. In some cases, the respirator can provide that purpose as well. If it's an N95 without an exhalation valve, for example, it works fine both as respiratory protection and as source control. But you need to address the risk in the workplace, not only to the wearer, but to others um, from the standpoint of source control. Next question up is, for the risk assessment, what does the term job classification mean? And I think I'll hand this one off to Matt. We've certainly received questions related to what does this job classification mean in the context of the exposure risk assessment, which is applicable to all workplaces. And what we mean by this is we are talking about different employees that work at your establishment that have potentially different underlying risks. Take a restaurant, for example. You might have a waitress, a janitor, a security guard, and a general manager all of which who perform very different job functions at that facility and therefore potentially have different types of underlying risk to COVID-19 exposure. And that is what we are driving at when we're talking about different employee classifications. What I recommend for employers is that they can start, if they have one, with an organizational chart for their, for their company and use that as a starting point to identify where different employees are working at their establishment and what things they can do to help identify which groups of these different employees have different risk and to be able to take precautionary steps to mitigate that. And probably the important thing to be aware of is there's actually a lot of flexibility with the employer's ability to classify their employees using a method that works in the context of their operation and their structure. It doesn't have some specific technical definition um, but it's a general statement that just invites you to classify the different workers or to classify the different work in a way that reflects their risk. Um, the next requirement up is how does the employer meet the requirement that the process must include feedback or an interactive process for the exposure risk assessment and infection control plan? You want to take this one, Matt? Sure thing. Just going off what Michael mentioned in regards to flexibility, we understand that every workplace is going to be unique in a certain regard. And we provide a lot of flexibility into how employers are allowed to engage with their employees, whether they're a dispersed crew that's working at various sites throughout the state or they're in one central location. We are trying to Allow we allow employers to use a variety of different methods to engage with their employees, some of which are outlined in the standard itself, such as safety committees, uh, safety meetings, or other, other interactive mechanisms. So we really do allow um, a broad approach to that and uh, encourage employers to think critically about where their employees are at and if they are dispersed, how to best involve those dispersed populations uh, in a group discussion about what's going on uh, in regards to their risk to COVID-19. And certainly one of the options that the standard spells out is you can always use your existing safety committee or safety meeting structure. If you use safety meetings, you have to ensure that it provides an interactive process. Those, of course, are already required of all employers in Oregon OSHA jurisdiction by longstanding legislative and regulatory requirements. So the next question up asks if the training needs to be available to employees or does it need to be completed by employees by the deadline of December 21st? And the training needs to be completed in the sense that it needs to not only have been developed, but it needs to have been taken by December 21st. If there are particular employers who are having difficulty meeting that deadline, um, you can reach out to Oregon OSHA uh, and talk about the issues that you're confronting, including the possibility of requesting a temporary variance to get a little bit more time to comply if there's a reason why you weren't able to make the training deadline. So question number seven says, OSHA states a mask is needed when six feet can't be maintained, but OHA says a mask at work regardless of the six foot distance. Um, I need to be clear that OSHA doesn't actually say that a mask is only needed when six feet can't be maintained. The rule, which was based on previous Oregon Health Authority guidance before this last week, states that a mask is needed most of the time indoors and is needed outdoors when six feet cannot be maintained. Let me say that in a little bit different order just so that we're clear. You need to have a mask outdoors when six feet cannot be maintained, and you need to have it almost all the time indoors. The six foot 
distance does not modify the use of indoor masks. And of course, uh, the Oregon Health Authority did provide some clarification this week related uh, to the issue of wearing facial coverings in office settings. The rule itself, the Oregon OSHA rule, specifically references the Oregon Health Authority guidance. So the answer about which one you should follow should be clear. The Oregon Health Authority guidance is what governs. It's not only because it governs generally as a public health requirement, but it is referenced in the rule. Um, the confusion on this issue is generated by some people misunderstanding the poster we put together. It has to do with some placement of comma issues, um, but trust me, the requirement is exactly the one I just described. So this says we have a COVID-specific email inbox that is monitored and questions directed to the appropriate experts. Does this meet the interactive requirement? Um, I guess I'm going to let you uh, tackle that one, Matt. It certainly <laughs> sounds like an important uh, and, and useful framework, whether it fully meets the interactive requirement for, the, uh, for each stage of the, of the way probably depends a bit on the specifics, but go mm -hmm. ahead. And just on that, that last note there, it's important to realize that the interactive component for talking about the risk assessment, for example, is going to be different than the interactive component that's required, for example, under training. And so I just wanted to start there with a you know, determination that while you can certainly use an email um, system to exchange um, or to capture ideas or that interactive process digitally, um, it, it really will come down to the specific back and forth that employees are allowed to be provided that opportunity to discuss, for example, the results of the exposure risk assessment. So as long as there is that feedback going back to those employees in some fashion, it's likely that this would be an acceptable, um, acceptable approach uh, for the components associated with the risk assessment, for example. But again, we're separating the risk assessment determination and the training requirements. Training requirements, understandably, involve all employees and is going to be a lot more involved than, say, distributing an exposure risk assessment that was performed at a higher level down to employees that it might impact. And with regard to the risk assessment, I, I think you'd agree that the interaction needs to be more than simply the opportunity to get a question answered. It needs to be an opportunity to actually engage mm -hmm. and have your viewpoint considered and affect the process. So simply having a process that allows employees to contact that email and then get a response, if that doesn't feed into a discussion about what actually belongs in the risk assessment, mm -hmm. that actually wouldn't be employee interaction for the purposes of the risk assessment. Absolutely. So the next question asks what the rule means when it talks about exceptionally high risk jobs. Um, I'll go ahead and take this one. So as you do the risk assessment, you may identify some positions that have high risk that are beyond um, other activities and other duties in the workplace. Um, it doesn't in that context have any meaning beyond that. When we talk about the exceptional risk categories, those are specifically spelled out in the rule. And basically they involve direct patient care, direct personal care, where you're engaged in toileting or bathing um, beyond what you'd think of simply providing uh, um, household services. And they also include emergency responders. Um, those are the exceptional risk activities that are identified in the rule and are therefore covered by subsection four. So the rule asks how this rule interacts with the governor's statewide freeze that took effect on Wednesday. Well, the answer is that essentially the statewide freeze trumps the rule. So while the rule does provide guidance on how certain activities um, such as operating a gym, can comply with the Oregon OSHA rules, that's a minimum standard. And the regulatory framework that we've been operating in from the beginning noted that whatever we adopt as a minimum standard, there may be a need to address things from a public health standpoint that go beyond the requirements of the rule. Um, the simple answer is that Oregon OSHA never prohibits work. So if you can't do the work safely, then in the Oregon OSHA rule context, you're able to do it as safely as possible while you still complete it. From a public health perspective, which is what the governor and the Oregon Health Authority are doing in the context of this pandemic, that doesn't necessarily work. 
There are some times where you simply need to say certain activities are prohibited. And that's what the freeze does, is it prohibits certain activities as well as scaling back others, at least for the next two week period in the state as a whole and for four weeks in the, uh, in the Portland area. Um, we will be enforcing those requirements, but we'll be reforcing them as a general provision addressing health rather than as specific rule violations because they do go beyond what our rule requires. So the next question is, do building operators have to inform companies that rent areas of the building the same as their own employees? The answer is that in the strict language of the rule, no, that is not required. But I have a question of my own, which is, why wouldn't you? I think it certainly would be a good idea for building operators to make the same sorts of notifications for those in the building who are not their employees as they make to their own employees. So the next question is, will the feasibility definition be applied to the vehicle face mask requirements? We support people with developmental disabilities who cannot wear a mask in vehicles, and access to respirators and successful fit testing is not always feasible. Um, the answer is the feasibility defense always applies in Oregon OSHA rulemaking. It's actually what I referred to a moment ago when I said that we never prohibit work. And so if it actually is true that you cannot get a respirator, and that you cannot engage in fit testing, then that constitutes a feasibility defense. Now, assuming that you can't do that, especially for a fairly limited group of employees, um, just because you've heard that there is resource constraint is probably a mistake. And um, one thing that you need to look at if you have individuals who cannot wear facial coverings for legitimate reasons, and you have to be engaged in work with them, you definitely should look at putting those employees in respiratory protection in order to address the risk they face when they're working with unmasked individuals. It says it sounds as if OSHA will provide training for infection control in exceptional work risk workplaces. Is that correct? The short answer to that question is no, that's not correct. Uh, but I'll let Matt talk a little bit more about what we are doing in relation to training. So as I mentioned earlier, we are, uh, and it is outlined in the rule, under subsection 3i, which is the training and information section that's applicable to all workplaces, we've gone through and outlined those different training requirements that Oregon OSHA is actively developing resources to assist employers uh, to use. And as Michael mentioned earlier, and I'll bring up here, is that although we develop these resources for use by, uh, by employers, uh, it's certainly um, acceptable for employers to develop their own in order to better reflect the risks, that, uh, risks and hazards that are uh, in their particular workplace. In, in regards to the infection control training, um, the agency is not developing that type of exceptional risk training for those employers it, with the assumption that those workplaces are gonna have a better understanding of what are the underlying hazards in their environment. And so while we've primed the employer with the resources that we provide in the general requirements of the training section, they can certainly use that in their infection control training, but we would expect that that exceptional risk workplace goes above and beyond those basic training materials that the agency is providing. And even where we provide those basic training materials for the lower risk employers, they're not the complete training um, system. The training has to be based on the infection control plan and the infection control plan has to be based on the risk assessment. Oregon OSHA can't fill that gap because we don't have the individual workplaces risk assessment. So the next question up says that the Oregon Health Authority shows two different things about face masks. Specifically asking on construction sites outdoor when six feet can be maintained, do you need a face mask? My understanding of the Oregon Health Authority guidance that is in place as part of the freeze is that the answer to that question is currently yes. Under our rule and under the ongoing guidance, the answer to that question would be no. But during this two week period, we are expecting people who are engaged re really in any activity um, where there are other individuals around, even if they're more than six feet away, to be wearing face masks. It's part of the exceptional steps we're taking um, in the context of the current surge in cases.
Um, so he says training must be done prior to December 21st. It states this training must be done remotely or by, by computer. Can we do it in person, social distance and masks worn? Uh, there is nothing in the rule that says this training must be done remotely or by computer. Um, if you can do it in accordance with the directions provided for other issues, doing in-person training is certainly compliant. It's not necessarily encouraged, but depending on the particular context, it may be the best overall approach. So this question actually isn't about the COVID rule, but about the broader question. It says, what impact have you seen in the rate of occurrence of other common sources of injuries or fatalities in the workplace while the majority of training attention and enforcement has been focused on COVID for the last several months. Um, of course, it remains true that you have to comply with all the Oregon OSHA rules, not just addressing the concerns of COVID. And we have issued some significant citations in the last few weeks that had nothing to do with COVID. But it's also certainly true that not only our attention, but the attention of safety professionals in across industry um, the attention of employers, the attention of managers, the attention of unions has all been focused in a lot of respects on COVID and all those other risks don't go away. To the degree we can tell so far, it doesn't appear that there has been a spike in those other issues as a result of the focus on COVID. Um, it may also be influenced by the fact that work has in a lot of cases slowed down some, um, which can help to reduce the risks. And of course, there's simply less work occurring, which makes it harder to, to sort of assess it in the moment, certainly when we have the ability to look at a broader data set and to look back at what happened, it will be interesting to look at that question more closely to see whether the focus on COVID meant that we and others were taking our focus too much uh, away from other issues. So the next question is, will there be guidance specific to positions such as direct support providers that provide in-home support to individuals experiencing intellectual or developmental disabilities? I imagine that there will be no requirement to evaluate the various personal client homes and work sites, correct? Um, so I'll answer that second question first. That is correct. Um, actually, in most cases, uh, with direct service providers, if they're not agency employees, they don't fall within our jurisdiction. And even for the agency employees, we're talking about evaluating the work, not evaluating the, the personal client homes and work sites. And so it should be viewed in, things of, in view of things that the employee and the employer have under their control. And we are engaging um, with the association to try to develop some guidance specifically in that context. We've actually put one of our best consultants on the project. Um, and so I think that we'll, we will be publishing some very useful guidance in collaboration with the industry specific to that issue. Um, the next question is, do you anticipate that the Oregon Health Authority's face covering guidance, currently titled as statewide freeze guidance, will change substantially once the freeze is over? Um, I anticipate that it probably will change in some respects, but Frankly, that's a question that needs to be addressed to the Oregon Health Authority at this point. So question, the next question is, if someone was last on site before they were contagious, more than 48 hours previous, is an all-site notification required? Um, I, I think that the question probably assumes information that isn't necessarily clear. The assumption that somebody who was non-symptomatic 48 hours ago and now tests positive was not contagious 72 hours ago is not actually a correct assumption. And so the answer would be, you do still need to do the notification. You have anything to add to that? 
I would also point out that the standard talks about two different um, types of employees in the notification uh, process. We're talking about the exposed employee, which is defined as someone who had an exposure with the infected person for a cumulative amount of time of 15 minutes or greater within six feet, and affected employees who are other workers who might have been working in a similar um, significant portion of the of the area where that exposed employee was also. And so while we uh, an employer could certainly do a, a site-wide notification process depending on the size, we are simply requiring the notification of that affected employee group in addition to the exposed employee. That's a good point. It did say site-wide, which depending on the site could be a definition. I would offer that as a general observation, if your question is whether you should notify or not, notify. Employees will be more confident that they're being protected if they know that you're communicating with them than if they think that you're only communicating the minimum. So just as a general practice in promoting effective safety and health and effective relationship with employees at a time when we all have a certain amount of fear about what may be happening in the workplace, more information is better than less information um, all the time consistently and the sort of notification you're offering here is not going to violate medical privacy issues so question number 18 says is audiometric testing affected by the rule um, the, other than the fact that those engaged in audiometric testing have to comply with the rule the answer to that would be no So the next question says, can you close office doors and take off the mask when alone in their own office? The answer to that is yes. Under the Oregon Health Authority guidance, the exception to wearing facial covering indoors is when you're at an individual private workstation. And an individual private workstation is specifically defined as an, a room that has walls that go all the way to the ceiling and a door that is closed. And so under those circumstances, you don't have to wear a facial covering even though you're still in the building. Next question says, once the infection control <coughs> plan is complete, do I have to submit it to OSHA or anyone else? You wanna take that? Sure. Um, the, the simple answer is no. Oregon OSHA does not require an employer to submit uh, in advance an exposure risk assessment or an infection control plan for, for that matter. Um, we don't expect uh, employers to submit that in advance. Um, of course, if we show up to do an inspection and we ask for a copy of it, you will want to give it to us then. Um, what qualifications do you need to assess risk? The rule doesn't provide any particular qualification set. Um, it's designed, particularly since it has a set of questions and we have a fillable template, to allow anybody who's familiar with the work to sort of walk through the issues and make the assessment of what the issues are and how they might be able to be addressed. Working inside, can one employee be in an area shortly following another employee who has not worn a mask? What about employees who regularly pull their masks down either completely or just exposing their nose? So I'll take the second part of that first. Employees who regularly pull their masks down either completely or just exposing their nose are not wearing the mask as required. It needs to cover the face and nose. That's not just it needs to be able to cover the face and nose. It actually needs to be covering the face and nose. And so you need to address that the same way you'd address if they had some other safety measure that they weren't following appropriately. With regard to the question about whether one employee can be in an area shortly following another employee who has not worn a mask, the only place where that would appropriately come up is if that is in a private office. And if you have individuals who are sharing private offices, um, you really should have at least a few hours between them and you should make sure that the surfaces are sanitized thoroughly before those individuals go in there to work. Um, so the next question is, the definition of an exposed individual includes someone who is likely to have been within six feet of the infected individual for a cumulative total of 15 minutes or more, cumulative over what period of time? The short answer is cumulative, of, cumulative over whatever period of time the individual was 
in, likely to have been infected. And so that could, in fact, cross days. Um, the starting point is absolutely you're looking at the cumulative total over the course of a single workday. But if you have an individual who's exposed for 10 minutes one day and 10 minutes the next day, you should go ahead and do the notification. So it looks like we've just about completed the questions that we have and we are running a bit over on the time. If there are other questions in the comment box or otherwise available, um, ah, okay, we'll take this question. This is a good one to sort of wrap things up on. It says, would you give some guidance for appropriate action when a customer or member of the public removes a mask once inside an establishment? If you become aware that there is somebody in the establishment in violation of the rule that they have to have a facial covering on, you should ask them to either put the mask back on or leave the establishment. If they will not leave, you shouldn't try to physically remove them or confront them, but you should advise them that they are trespassing and they're not welcome to continue shopping unless they put their mask back on. You should refuse service and you should, in most cases, contact law enforcement and ask them to deal with the issue, not as a question of enforcing the facial covering requirement, but as a question of enforcing the, uh, the basic laws related to trespass. I said that was going to be the last question, but we have another question specifically about masks that says, do you have to wear a mask if you're in an open indoor work area but can maintain social distancing? The answer to that is yes, you have to wear a mask when indoors, regardless of social distance, unless you're the only person in the room. Um, go ahead and go to the next one. That's really the same question again. That's it. Is that it? Okay. Well, with that, thank you for your time. I hope that this has been useful. If you have other questions that you put into the, um, into the comments or that you raise comments afterwards, we will be trying to respond to those, certainly collectively. We also, probably Monday, are going to be posting a comprehensive question and answer document on the rule that will address many of these questions. And frankly, we appreciate you asking the questions because you help to inform the content of that document. So on behalf of both Matt and myself, I, and Oregon OSHA as a whole, thank you. Um, these are going to be difficult times. We're all going to be facing ch challenges next week as we look at a, at a family holiday that we're going to be spending in greater isolation than many of us are accustomed to. But if we work together, we really can get past this and can get back to a situation where even if we have to wear masks, we're able to otherwise go about our lives in a pretty normal fashion. So let's hope that we can do what we need to make this freeze as short a duration as possible. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Stay safe and stay healthy.